Hello, I am Kelleen Ayton. Welcome to Schools Not Out, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE students. You can watch this lesson real time on Television Jamaica YouTube channel or One Spot Media. We also are live on Music 99 and gojamaica.com. If you have questions on today's subject, you can send them in to Television Jamaica's Facebook page or Instagram at television underscore Jamaica. Today's lesson is communication studies. We will be focusing on module one, gathering and processing information. Our objectives from the Cape Communication Studies Syllabus 2019 require students to be able to determine the appropriateness of data collection methods and instruments, including the use of the internet as an electronic resource, distinguish between primary and secondary sources, define key concepts, Determine the appropriateness of data collection methods. So for today, specifically, at the end of the lesson, students should be able to define research and identify different types of research. Identify different types of sources and provide examples of each. Evaluate a source define key terms associated with the process of research, identify advantages and disadvantages of different methods of data collection. Let's begin. We are gonna take a walk down memory lane. Students, have you ever been given a task, an assignment to do a research? And I know Specifically for your IA, you were asked to do some amount of research on the oral section. So I know what I'm talking about. You have had this experience. So you have this assignment to do. You have that task to complete. And what you're seeing on the screen, you can identify with it. You have used a number of books. You have stayed up all night. You have drunk coffee. You have fallen asleep at the computer because you are dedicating so much time and effort towards doing this paper and doing it well. And you submit your paper all of, after all of this work. And after submitting your paper, students, you get your feedback. The paper is returned to you. And just by these facial expressions, you are realizing that this is not what you anticipated. This is not the effort that the reward for the effort you had placed in that paper. Because guess what? Your paper looks like this. Every inch of that paper has red ink pen from your teacher. Not to mention that big letter F suggesting that you have failed. And as a result of this failing grade students, this is your feedback. Disappointment, and this is evident in your facial expression. For others, we resort to tears. For other students, the best way of dealing with this is just crushing that paper. And for others, crushing the paper is not all, but I need to just discard, throw it away. So students, you can identify with this at some stage, at some time in your school life. And the questions, the concerns, the statements that you have made as it relates to the paper is, boy, I can never satisfy this lady or this man. 
I give her her work and this is what I get. I can't bother. I'm fed up. Others may look at these, may, these statements. What went wrong? Miss, I used sources. I cited my sources most times. I used MLA and APA documentation for variety. I reached the required word limit. I spent a lot of time on this assignment. And furthermore, I got help. So let's quickly look at what went wrong. You said that you used sources. And yes, but what type of sources did you use? Were they adequate? Were they relevant to your research paper? You said that you cited sources most times. Now let's focus on that word, most. How could you be using sources and not crediting them all the time? You said you used MLA and APA. And both of, both of them are documentation styles. You need to stick to one. I reached the required limit. If you have any questions, we are going for a break right now. If you have any questions on what we have done so far, you can send them in on our various platforms. And I will see if I can answer them when we return from the break. Stay tuned. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much. Gathering and processing information. So before the break, students, we did a little flashback of feelings of disappointment as it relates to doing a research, investing time, and getting back a disappointing grade. So moving forward now, we are going to be looking at what we should do in order to not be disappointed when we get back our grades because we're going to do it the correct way. So we're going to be focusing on research. When you hear the word research, what comes to mind? Research can be defined as a systematic attempt to prove answers to questions about the relationship between two or more variables. In essence, students, you have a question and you want to find answers. It also involves investigating facts and then formulating a generalization based on the interpretations of those facts. What am I saying? So when it comes on to research, we must base our findings on factual information. It cannot be hearsay. It cannot be how we feel or what we think solely and wholly about the topic. It must be substantiated by facts. So where do we, so what types of research methods are there? We have what we call quantitative research and qualitative research, all right? What are the differences between them? When you involve in quantitative research, it is statistical in nature. In essence, you are using figures. For qualitative, it is more theoretical in nature. Let's go again quantitative it focuses on what can be counted what is measured and what is quantified remember we said we are using numbers while qualitative focuses on what may be inferred what may be deduced from behavior quantitative again uses a representative and large sample so here we are thinking about maybe a questionnaire to use while the qualitative uses a smaller but more but informative sample. And lastly, 
quantitative describes data collected so it describes data collected while for the qualitative it makes interpretation on the data collected so examples of quantitative research that you may be involved with in are descriptive research or correlational research or for qualitative it could be something historical in nature or ethnographic let's talk about our sources we said students that or i said earlier that we must be using factual information it is not something that we are we are not making our research or developing our research paper based on our personal feelings so we must find sources and i'm gonna add reputable sources sources here research resources are usually thought of as primary and secondary what is the difference between primary source and a secondary source when we talk about primary sources we are talking about first hand records of an event they are written created or recorded during the period under investigation so in essence the researcher is finding that information getting that information first and you're going out in the field and you're getting that information yourself for the secondary they are usually written or produced after the event that they purport to comment on so somebody else has already gone done that research have it documented and you are going to use this now to as factual information to prove the answer to whatever research question you are looking at so let's look at some examples of primary and secondary sources for primary sources a diary your interview works of art official and private records pictures artifacts oral history and i just want to explain oral history so this one students is for instance you want you're doing a research on maroons and you want to find out you know get authentic information their way of life etc and you go to maroon town and you want to speak with interview a, a member of the community and it would tend to be the older ones and that interview that you have with this older member of the community that's what we call an oral you're getting oral history or information from that person secondary we have literature review we have textbooks magazines journals newspaper dictionary atlas encyclopedia and the list is not exhausted so our first activity is on the screen and you are going to be writing you're going to be answering as we go along group the following under the headings primary sources secondary sources so get your pencils and paper out and let's work this out together so i will read and you will write prs to see what's your answer survey conducted with six formers Neville Bell reporting at the National Stadium on the Lacrosse match. Sports news commentary on TV. Are you writing? Geography textbook. CXC results data sheet on passes in communication studies for Jamaica. Mrs. Beverly McDonald's class register. So you should have your answers here. Let's go to the reveal. So on the primary, you, shall, you should have written the survey. Neville Bell reporting. Remember, he's live and he's telling us what's happening. The CXE results data sheet, the class register. And for secondary, the sports news commentary on TV. Remember that that would be after the fact that the, play, the match has been played, the commentary is made, and then you are going to use that commentary. So it becomes secondary and your geography textbook let's look at evaluating sources 
It is important, students, that we evaluate our sources. Sometimes we have a tendency that when we are doing a research, we simply put in keywords from the research in the search engine. And the first thing that comes up, that's what we use. We must evaluate our sources unless we are going to be in difficulty. So when we talk about evaluating sources, we should always use what we call scholarly sources. They are reputable. We can trust them. Books, newspaper articles, and notice I have in red, not news items such as eyewitness reports. Those are going to have bias, heavily opinionated. Journal articles or government documents. And I want you to focus on these reputable websites, .gov. Dot edu dot org. These are the preferred websites. So how now do we evaluate? Mrs. is saying we need to evaluate our source. I want you to write this down. This is an acronym that you are going to use to guide you to effectively evaluate your source. Follow these steps. When you find a source, students, you are going to use the TARP approach. The first letter is T, and that stands for time. You must look at the date of the article. We want information that is current. So we have to check how long this has been produced. The timelines tend to be five years. Some persons, some books will tell you up to 10, but we do not pass that 10, go beyond 10. Please remember though, if you are doing, an, if you are doing a historical research, your, some of your sources may be um, beyond the 10 years. So it depends on the nature of your research. Author, so we are on to the first A. It is imperative that we investigate the author or authors of these documents. We want to know students that they are qualified um, to write about the issue that they have produced. You want to look at their credentials, their qualification, their level of qualification, and not just their level of qualification, right? So you could have a doctorate, you could have a master's, but the area in which you have that qualification is not the area in which you're writing about. So check that out. Authority. You want to ensure that whatever references are made to other authors or other organizations that they are knowledgeable on the topic you can trust them too relevance please ensure students that whenever you choose a, a, a an article right or whatever you are using to as your source that it relates to the topic at and not just a little sentence in there but you can get substance from that article, from that source, to answer your question. Perspective, we want balance. And so you need to ensure that your source is unbiased. It is objective. It's not forcing you. They present their findings, all right? It's not forcing you to believe a particular, it's not argumentative. And so the last one is purpose. You need to know the purpose for which that article was written. For instance, if it was written to entertain, then it may not be the best piece to use for your research. So remember, the TARP approach is crucial in helping you to evaluate your source. And just a few other things that you should bear in mind as you evaluate your source. Ensure there's a bibliography or a reference list, we must credit, right? You have to show you that, that, that there should be evidence that research was carried out and they have acknowledged the persons, the bodies, the organizations that, they con that contributed to this paper. Place of publication, evidence of bias, we don't want that. And we need to check that the site is reputable if you are using a internet source. 
let's look at this question as we just ended evaluation of sources. Patrick, a 50-year-old man, witnessed an accident and gave this report to the police. I was on my way to church with my wife and kids when I saw the car speeding at about 80 miles per hour. The driver lost control and slammed into the Honda, driving in the opposite direction. Myself and two other passers-by assisted the driver and his wife and two children from the car. We rushed them to the hospital. Let's look at the questions. Which of the following could not, not be a source of data about the accident? Patrick's wife, the driver of the Honda, the police officer, the passerby. So your answer should be students, which one is not? That should be the police officer because based on the prompt that we got, we were not informed of a police officer being on the scene. All right. Patrick is a source of information about the accident. Why? Because he's an eyewitness, because he's a Christian. He rushed the driver to the hospital. He knew how fast the driver was driving. Why is he a source of information? The best answer would be because he's an eyewitness. So let's go on to some key terms that you should be familiar with. And sometimes students, you still have a little difficulty um, deciphering what these are. So you should be familiar with credibility, reliability, validity. When we consider a source to be reliable, what are we talking about? We are simply saying it can be depended on to be consistent. So we are talking about consistency for reliability and that it can be trusted. Credibility now means that it can be believed and it can be accepted. While validity is evidence that is relevant to the issue. So we are talking about relevance here. It can be supported and it is convincing, logical and irrefutable. Another definition that I want to point out is context. I find out that students shy away from this, particularly when answering it for the internal assessment. When we talk about context students, it's simple. We're talking about the circumstances out of which the writing emerges. And think of these three questions, where, when, what. Where could be a literal place where the study was conducted. Was it China? Was it France? Was it Italy? When? So the time period we're talking about, was it during the Industrial Re um, Revolution for argument's sake? What? And this, this one we can identify with easily the situation what was happening at the time in which this paper was produced so now that we are taught we are experiencing covid 19 for argument's sake we are going to be noticing that a lot of research papers are going to be done investigating how this came about how we can treat it and all of that so what would have prompted this writing is the fact that we have this pandemic going on all right, so current events can prompt our writing. Data, instrument, and instrumentation. You know that data refers to the information we get from our, 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 our res the information researchers obtain on the subjects or from our sample. The instrument is what we use or the device that we use to collect the data, such as your questionnaire, right? For instrumentation, we mean the process, the process that you diligently follow to collect your data. So let us not forget these terms. And let's do the second activity. In a recent discussion among some sixth form college students, the issue of social media as a source of information came up for debate. Some of the members of the group felt it was a new and useful tool, while others warned against its danger. We're talking about social media. 
Number one, which of the following would best characterize the information which a researcher may get from Facebook and Twitter? Is it the accuracy? Is it the credibility? Is it the reliability or is it the currency? Facebook, Twitter, which of these? Definitely students, basic, bearing in mind that these are social media platforms, it would have to be the currency. That's what. All right, so two, which of the following would affect the validity? We are using back these words that I just defined. Would affect the va validity of any information gathered from social media. So one says, posts are opinionated. Two, posts may be about past events. Three, posts may be written by non-experts. Work quickly. What would be your answer? We are looking at the validity of the information from social media. By now, you should have come up with your answer, which is one and two. Posts are opinionated and they may be written by non-experts. We're heading into methods of data collection. So this is what we use to gather our information. Now, on the screen here are three primary methods of data collection, and you need to know the advantages and disadvantages of each. Now, an interview students, you know that is conducted, it may be face to face, it could be telephone, it could be online, you're using Skype, you're using Zoom, for example. Questionnaires, they can be self-administered, so the researcher comes in person and distributes, and or it may be mailed. So this could be through the post, it could be email. Observation two, and we're going to be talking about participant and non-participant observation. So let's quickly go through our advantages and disadvantages of interviews. One advantage of interviews is that individuals can, can contribute their own views on an issue. So you're at liberty to speak about whatever is asked. Greater flexibility for both interviewer and interviewee. Points can be explained, clarified and corrected if any misinterpretation arises. So if the researcher, if the interviewer, sorry, or the interviewee um, doesn't understand, there's, there's opportunity for clarification. A lot of information can be garnered from experienced interviewers. So you can solicit a lot of information if you're good at collecting. Interviewers can make relevant observations on sensitive information. And this is good, students, because sometimes you may ask a question and this is a very sensitive issue to the interviewee. Just by the facial expression, you will know you should not continue along this line. There are disadvantages to the interview. What are they? It is open to bias and subjectivity. It may collect unnecessary and irrelevant details, a lot of talking. It does not allow for anonymity. So you definitely know that this information is from John Paul or Mary Brown. And as a result of the anonymity prop issue, question asks, questions asked may cause discomfort, thus not reflecting. So if the person feels uncomfortable, he or she will not um, want to speak the truth. They don't want to, you to know that about them. All right? Questionnaires, they tend to have rating scales. So in the first um, picture there, we are seeing words um, to, for you to read and choose. For the second, we are seeing numbers used for the rating scale. And the questions are open-ended or closed-ended. Open-ended, so there is space, a box, a line for you to write on. While the closed-ended, you are just going to tick or shade. For the questionnaire, it's convenient for distributing. To, so we're on to the questionnaire now. Convenient for distributing to large numbers in a short time and it covers a wide geographical area. So we can do a lot with the questionnaires for large sample groups. 
they can be completed at the respondent's convenience and privacy. Respondents can check records if they have forgotten any important information needed. It facilitates quick reporting anal and analysis, and definitely it guarantees anonymity. On the other side, though, students, what are the disadvantages? It limits the scope of asking probing questions. It's inflexible. The items are forced choice. They usually limit the kinds of info that can be elicited. They have short spaces for responses, lower response rate. And our last is the observation. It allows for collection of primary data in a natural setting. Researchers are better able to appreciate and understand the factors. It can give high return of data. It can be an unobtrusive way to collect data if the researcher is taken as one of the group and is discreet in recording. The disadvantages though, reactions of respondents may be misinterpreted. It's important and relevant information may be missed. Actions and behavior never remain static, people change. Reactions may be altered if they are away they are being observed. And this is what we call the Hawthorne effect. So you know that you are being observed, of course you're gonna behave differently. You're gonna be on your P's and Q's as we would say. Observer can become distracted, lose focus, and miss relevant information. And I, there are two for the secondary methods. We have document reviews. We can get valuable and intimate thoughts. That's an advantage. Original documents are less subject to memory decay. And the disadvantages of document review is that they may have deliberately biased perspectives on the issue. For the internet now, students, what are some of the advantages that we have? The advantages, ability to obtain a wealth of information. Sometimes we get confused. It is very easy to access, just a click of a button right there in your bed. It saves time. It is comparatively inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Avenue for access access accessing information and articles. Some disadvantages. It provides a huge amount of information, thereby causing information overload. Anyone can publish. So we are thinking of Wikipedia, for instance. Theft of personal information and misuse of the information. And it is not arranged according to system and index format. So our activity, we are working a lot today. A group of geography students from Millennium High is conducting research into the extent of the river pollution in their community. The group is planning to use observation as their primary method of data collection. Why might observation not be the best method to collect data in this case? All right, so let's, let us just quickly look back. Geography students, they are looking at the extent of the river pollution, all right, and they are planning to use observation. Why might observation not be the best method to collect data in this case? It may be expensive to carry out, mm, yes or no. Hawthorne's effect, I just explained that. The phenomenon is bound by time and activity. They might not be able to leave school. So our answer for this is going to be three only because observation is not expensive to carry out. Hawthorne's effect, you're looking at the river. So the river is not gonna change or get shy when you get there. Four, they might not be able to leave school. If you are doing something like that, then prescribed time would be given and permission for you to do so. So we are going to end up with three. Which of the following would be the best tool for, collection, for collecting data in this research? Is it a focus group? Is it a content analysis? Questionnaires or interviews? Remember the prompt spoke about the extent to which 
So the best answer students, you're looking at a large sample, all right? So um, um, it would be questionnaires. And this is gonna lead now into question three. The best source for data on the pollution in the river is, is it the students? You want to get information. Is it the members of the community? Is it the garbage collectors? Is it, the, is it our geography textbooks? The best source for this would be members of the community. They are the ones who live there. Why would the students not be able to use this research to generalize about river pollutions in their country? Why? Is it because the respondents lied about the pollution? Is it that the research was only conducted in one community? Is it a case that the students were not trained researchers? Or is it that the students did not see the pollution themselves? Now, our best selection here would be the research was only conducted in one community. You cannot use one to justify all of them. So we are going to do one last activity, students, that will um, bring us to the end of this. Our culminating activity. Jasmine is preparing a speech on the causes of COVID-19 to be delivered at a science fair to be held at her school. Among other sources, she read several online articles published by the World Health Organization. And two quick questions. What type of information is the World Health Organization likely to provide? Now, I know that maybe your first option would be primary, but remember students, while it serves as it provides primary, it can use other information from other reputable sources, so primary and secondary would be the best answer. All of the following are advantages that the interview as a data collection method would offer to Jasmine. Except, let's look at the keyword, except immediacy of response, further probing of responses, low potential for researcher bias, rephrasing and clarification of questions. So we're looking now at the advantages. So definitely immediacy is one, probing is another, rephrasing is another advantage. So our answer would be low potential for researcher bias. We have come to the end of another lesson. We have discussed a lot this morning. We have defined research. We have identified different types of research. We have identified different types of sources, provided examples of each, evaluated a source, defined key terms, and it's important that you remember them. We identified advantages and disadvantages of different methods of data collection, and we have discussed, meth and well, we didn't get to methods of persuasion. Now students, we are coming closer and closer to the examination date. You will be in school next week. First of all, let me remind you that you keep safe. Please use this time wisely. You are going out, make use of it. You have all these lessons on YouTube. You can go and look back at them. You have more than enough information to help you going forward. Let me wish you all the best students. Remember, read your questions carefully. This is multiple choice, wrong or right? So you must read your questions carefully. Do not leave any blank spaces or sh on any shading um, blank. If you're even gonna go back there, students, make a note that you go back after you have ended. Read your questions carefully. 
That's all for today on Cape Communication Studies. We hope you grasp some of the points we discussed. You can catch a repeat of today's lessons on JNN Today at 4 p.m. and the School's Not Out highlights on Saturday between 1 and 4 p.m. It will also be on video on demand on One Spot Media. Remember, exams start July 13th. Check the various platforms for revisions. Until next time, I'm Kelleen Ayton. Up next is CSEC Accounts with Latoya Chambers. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much. Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it.